Good afternoon. It is 4 p.m. and I call our board meeting of June 2023 20, to order. Roll call vote, Rosie. Trustee Anderson. Here. Trustee Crane. Here. Trustee Weigand. Here. Trustee Pearson. Here. Trustee Murphy. Here. Trustee Ursoilu. Here. Trustee Barto. Here. Dr. Smith. Here. Great. And number item two, we will now adopt the agenda. Trustee Crane, did you want to make a change? Yes. Um, President Anderson, uh, can we please move uh, the introduction of this new student board members to uh, item 10 just to rec just to introduce them and then we can vote on them later. Yes, introduce them as the proposed student board members. Yes. Yes. Okay, do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Okay, moved by Trustee Crane, seconded by Trustee Wagen and Bartow. Wagen. Roll call vote. Trustee Anderson? Yes. Later. Trustee Crane? Yes. Trustee Weigand? Yes. Trustee Pearson? Yes. Trustee Murphy? Yes. Trustee Ursoilu? Yes. Trustee Barto. Yes. And do we have any closed session agenda or comment cards? No. Okay. All right. The items for close set the closed session portion of our meeting are 4A, student discipline, one case. 4B, update on student discipline case, one case. 4C, public employee evaluation, title, superintendent. 4D, conference with legal counsel, existing litigation. 4E, complaint concerning employee number 202305HR. 4F, public employee discipline, dismissal, release, employment. And 4G, public employee discipline, dismissal, release, employment for number 202305. 06 HR. The time is 4.03 and we will now go into closed session and we will return to open session at 6 p.m. Read out. In closed session, the following motion was made, moved by Trustee Crane and seconded by Trustee Weigand, that the Board of Education approve the resignation agreement and general release for number 202306HR. The roll call vote was seven ayes and zero noes. We will now start the open session portion of our meeting for June 20th, 2023, and the time is 6 p.m. We will now have our moment of reflection followed by the Pledge of Allegiance led by Trustee Wagon. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Item 9, the adoption of the minutes from our meeting from June 13th, 2023. President Anderson, I'd like to amend my report that I made publicly, and I had stated in the, in the minutes uh, are showing that I said 10 out of 21 cappies, and I'd like to amend it to 10 out of 24 cappies, for the record. Did you have a motion? So moved. I second. Okay, moved by Trustee Wigand, seconded by Trustee Pearson. Roll call vote. Trustee Anderson? Yes. Trustee Crane? Yes. Trustee Wagon? Yes. Trustee Pearson? Yes. Trustee Murphy? Yes. Trustee Ursoilu? Yes. Trustee Bartow? Yes. Okay, next item 10, introduction of staff, Christy Flores, Director of Engagement, Partnership, and Expanded Learning. Ms. Shields? I am so in excited to introduce someone we know very well to a new position. We're so excited to bring Dr. Christy Flores to the district office to serve in this position. As you know, for two decades, she has worked in the district and been part of the Costa Mesa family. She's an award-winning leader. She's created award-winning programs with her team at uh, Davis, and so we're so excited to bring her to this position with her experience and knowledge of students, families, needs, and community organizations. 
We're really excited about the level of quality and service she'll be able to provide at the district. Christy, would you like to join us? You. <laughs> President Anderson, members of the board, Dr. Smith, executive cabinet, and esteemed guests, it is with enormous gratitude that I continue my career in Newport Mesa Unified School District as the new Director of Engagement, Partnership, and Expanded Learning. After spending 10 years as a classroom teacher and then 10 more years as a site leader, I'm excited to start this new chapter serving students and families. In addition to bringing the perspectives of teacher and site leader, I wear multiple hats, that of being a Newport Mesa community member, and my two favorite hats, that as a wife to Chris Flores, a history teacher at Costa Mesa High School, an <laughs> assistant football coach, and a mom to Isabel and Isaiah, who are uh, Newport Mesa Unified School District students. So with all of those perspectives, passion, and drive, I look forward to the opportunity to serve in this new role. Thank you so much. Thank you. And next up, we had an addition to move um, the to do an, another introduction for the proposed student board members, Trustee Crane. Yes, thank you, President Anderson, um, President Anderson, Superintendent Smith, and the Board of Trustees. I would like to introduce you currently the proposed student board members. And as I call your name, can you please stand in the, right there on the front when I call your name? Uh, we have from. Back Bay High School, Valeria Orozco. <laughs> Corona Del Mar High School, Peyton Vovan. <laughs> Costa Mesa High School, India Howerton, who is not here, she's on vacation. Uh, Early College High School, Victor Jimenez. <laughs> Estancia High School, Jose Gomez, who is not here, he's also on vacation. And Newport Harbor High School representative, Brianna Garcia. So these, these board, student board members that are going to be approved tonight, a little later, they went through a thorough uh, application process and an interview process, and uh, the Board of Trustees basically get to choose one from each high school site. And here they are today. <coughs> are, are 20, 23, 24 being presented to you and I will approve the, their um, assignment at the end of the evening. Thank you. Thank you for being here today. Next, we have item 11, recognition of student awards. Ms. Torres. Uh, good evening, everyone. It is my pleasure to always provide um, a wonderful, warm welcome to all of our students who will be recognized tonight. Um, I'm going to start off with our elementary group, if that's OK. Um, and so, we, which I will gladly turn over to our uh, new assistant soup here very soon, Dr. Sir, who's in the crowd back there. Um, for elementary tonight, we have really tried to find additional ways to recognize some of our youngest winners in our district. And so we're very pleased tonight to be able to recognize our field of honor winners. And so we have two students who will be receiving recognition this evening. Um, they participated in the Exchange Club of Newport Harbor uh, Field of Honor Awards. And they could either provi uh, provide a um, and submit patriotic art or young citizenship essays. And so this evening, I would like to welcome up uh, Jocelyn Lamb of Adams. If she's in the room, she might be on vacation. Jocelyn, are you here tonight? And then Fifi Sliman. Do we have Fifi? Come on up. So both of our individuals this evening won first place. So congratulations to you, Fifi. Thank you. 
Thank you. And we'll make sure that Jocelyn gets her award um, sent to her. At this time, I'd like to welcome up Dr. Mike Shaka, who is going to introduce our secondary recognition um, award winners tonight. Thank you so much, President Anderson, members of the board, Dr. Smith, Executive Cabinet, and all of our guests. Uh, Vice President Crane just mentioned the cappies a little while ago, <laughs> and so we're going to expand on that a little bit um, with some special awards and, and honoring tonight. So I'd like to introduce Dr. Jake Haley, Principal of Cornell Mar, to tell us a little bit more about the success we have with the cappies. Thank you. Good evening, President Anderson, members of the board, Dr. Smith, Executive Cabinet, distinguished guests, and new school board members. Welcome uh, for the uh, representing our schools. Couldn't be more excited uh, to be here consecutive weeks talking about student achievement uh, and the great things happening in, in our community um, and really appreciate uh, the vision of the board and the supports for the art. Uh, as you know, I've been uh, in the district for a decade and really have seen uh, in two different uh, zones the focus on growing the arts and supporting that. And uh, nothing is a greater testimony than what you're going to hear tonight when it comes to our drama program, which is part of our PAMA Academy and kind of pathway at Corona Del Mar High School. Uh, it's a record uh, kind of setting. If you're not familiar uh, with the CAPI Awards, it really truly is kind of the Academy Awards for the local drama within uh, Orange County and recognition uh, for great performances uh, within drama for uh, several different aspects. And you're going to hear the wide array of uh, kind of awards that uh, we won. Again, a total of 10 CAPI Awards in various categories. And that doesn't happen without the support uh, of all of you, our community, and really uh, a dedication to the arts. And so with that, uh, the mastermind behind it uh, is our wonderful teacher, Elisa Barra. Elise, come on over and let's hear about the captures. Yes. Cool. Um, hello. <laughs> My name is Elise Barra. Uh, you saw me last week. Um, so I am pleased to present uh, to you um, our award-winning um, uh, program um, that uh, was awarded and nominated um, with 22 nominations, uh, both in costume, um, in tech, in uh, choreography, um, in ensemble building, and performance overall uh, for She Kills Monsters and uh, for Chicago. Uh, and we pride ourselves for our award uh, winning and history making 10 wins, including best musical in Orange County. Uh, um, some of our students are here and some of them are enjoying their summer. Um, they won for best musical, best songs for Cell Block Tango, best student choreography, best lighting design, best costume design in a play and a musical, best ensemble, best lead actress in a musical, best set design in a musical, and best makeup design in a play, uh, which we're very excited about. Um, all of this is due to your unending support. Um, so I will be reading some of the names uh, for our wonderful uh, human beings who showed up today, right? There is over 80 people who were responsible for this production and students. Um, so it really does take a whole uh, town uh, to build this beautiful piece. So I'll be reading them today. Um, Willow Boyd. Right. 
Next um, would be the Harbor Council PTA report, and there is no report this evening. Um, there is no report also from our CSCA representative, but we do have our NMFT representative, Laura Mayberry, here. Oh. Well, I'm excited to be here on a day where there were so many students. I didn't expect so many since it was summer, so I got the good day. Um, first, we would like to acknowledge the Juneteenth uh, celebration yesterday. Uh, this Thursday, our field rep, Anthony Solis, and our president, Rhonda Reed, along with some other officers from our board and general members, will be joining our CFT labor affiliate in Pasadena to help a newly supported uh, union that has formed and trying to encourage their district to bargain and negotiate with them in good faith. So NMFT would really like to express our gratitude that our district and our superintendent have transparent and collaborative working relationships with our labor leaders and unions. So we're very grateful for that. Um, next week, our president and treasurer are going to join labor leaders for a week-long conference. Uh, they're looking forward to conversations with labor leaders throughout the state um, with our shared work of continually improving the working environment for our certificated members who impact the learning environment of our students. Um, as for me, I just returned from the AP reading and scoring, so I will be staying put while they're off doing all those things. And now I join all the AP teachers and AP students while we nervously wait for our scores to come in. <laughs> and lastly, I would like to applaud all our certificated staff members who are working summer school and various summer programs. It does not go unnoticed. So thank you. Thank you. Next, we have community input on non-agendized item, items. Trustee Wigan. This is an opportunity for the public to address the board regarding items not on the regular meeting agenda. Comments on non-agenda topics are limited to three minutes per comment, up to 20 minutes per topic. A speaker may not relinquish his or her time to another person. By order of the Brown Act, section 54954.2, the board will take no action nor have any discussion on non-agendized items. The superintendent may provide clarification during superintendent's comments. First, we have uh, Narina H. It will pick you up. If okay. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, my name is Narina. I'm a mother and resident in Newport Mesa. Today, I have two topics of concern. First, it has come to my attention that Newport Harbor High School has QR codes with pride flags that links minor children to websites offering them information on how to medically transition. Why? Why is this in the school? Why is it not only allowed, but actively pushed? Why are we providing minor children with information that states they do not need a therapist's signature or note of any sort to receive hormones or steps to transition in any way at all? Why are school administrators and teachers hanging pride flags and or plastering pride stuff all over their campuses and classrooms? This is not academic. The pride flag literally excludes heterosexuals. This is not being inclusive. If the pride flag includes black and brown stripes, which by the way, I am mixed, it literally excludes Caucasians. It's not being inclusive. 
It was just a couple years ago Newport Mesa terminated a teacher for displaying the pride flag and bragging about brainwashing her class to salute it. Superintendent Smith, I'm asking you directly, why was that not okay, but promoting this is? I'd appreciate your comment on that. Was it because it went viral and the district was humiliated on the national stage? That can happen again. To be clear, there is only one true flag that represents everyone in America, the American flag. Yet Newport Harbor High School takes it one step farther, promoting sexual pride flags with guidance to push hormone replacement therapy to children. Gross. With, while this is very concerning to me, I am even more concerned by the lack of parents, and I know for a fact there are many of, that are not speaking up. To those of you in the crowd or watching this online, what are you doing? Why aren't you attending these meetings and making comments? Why aren't you being a voice for the children? Why are you coming up with a million excuses as to why you are staying silent? Being a keyboard warrior means nothing if you aren't physically standing up and being a voice for our children too. It is long overdue to speak up for our children. If you won't stand up for your child, I will, but you should not be counting on other parents to stand up for your child. There, is, there are a group of people who speak up over and over again. They have paved the way. They have made it easier for you to speak up. So where are you? Your silence means you are allowing this con to continue. It only stops when we say no more. It is time to bare your teeth, roar like a lion, because enough is enough. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Fred Smoller. Good evening. Um, I'm Fred Smoller. I teach at Chapman University, which is in Orange. Uh, about 10 years ago, you may have remembered uh, houses that were brought to the Great Park, 2015, before that, 2013. Well, for better or worse, I'm the guy who did that. Uh, that was the Department of Energy program called the Solar Decathlon, and Solar Decathlons are held mm -hmm. throughout the world, Europe, Asia, Middle East, etc., China in particular. I'm here tonight because I was able to get a $5 million grant from the state legislature, um, and we created our own California competition, and it's in front of you. It's called the uh, Orange County Sustainability Decathlon. We're the only county out of 58 to have it. And what I wanted to do, because my wife was a teacher um, in Wood, in Santa Ana, is to make sure that we carved out money that we would give directly to K through 12 teachers in order for them to bring their students to the decathlon, which will be held October 5th through the 15th in the Costa Mesa, not far from here, uh, OC Fair and Event Center. And you'll see more posters and things like that. In any case, this is happening. I think the grants are small, about $1,000. And we want the teachers to bring it, ideally, it's your, your show, of course, but we were thinking they would come in the morning, perhaps we'd provide the lunch, and then the afternoon they would have a session about the environment, and we're providing all the teaching materials, PowerPoints, films, discussion questions, and anything they think we should include. My goal is to have this here every two years. And when I tried to get a second five million for 2025, the state said, uh, good luck, but more importantly what they said is um, we'll give you the five million for one, but we have to see local area buy-in. That is, if you would like this to return, if you think sustainability is a real issue, coastal erosion, wildfires, drought, all of these things are apparent in Orange County, I would like you to work with the superintendent and the new engagement officer and say, check this guy out, this is a pretty good idea. And then the principals would hopefully encourage the teachers to apply for the grant. It's a one-page form. It's pretty straightforward. In any case, it's coming. We got the money. It will be here October 5th. We have an actual education day. And I've been presenting to every school bird in Orange County. So superintendent, uh, my new best friend, uh, <laughs> I, uh, I think I left out cards for you so you know how to reach me. I'm in Orange. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. 
Next, we have superintendent's comments. Dr. Smoller, that's a dangerous statement to say you're my best friend. You gotta be careful. <laughs> read, read the audience, man. Uh, well, <laughs> best friend of the engagement <laughs> we, we will definitely make staff um, aware of that um, uh, and, and every opportunity we have to contribute in something worthwhile, so, so thank you. Let me, um, let me say this. That, uh, I continue to say that this board, of all the boards I've ever worked with, uh, cares the most about public comment and hearing from their constituents. The Brown Act provides that the board doesn't have to hear redundant comments, um, yet this board lets the community speak, um, even if it's something that's already been said. Um, I addressed this last week. I'll, I'll, I'll say again what I said then, and then I'll, I'll leave this, because there's no more clarification to be made. This district has no prohibition of flags. Um, in fact, we have lots of flags that we have in our history classes, multiple flags, our language classes flags, uh, and yes, we have pride flags. Um, none of them can replace the national flag, the American flag. I said last week, if a flag ever replaces our American flag, then that's the inappropriate use of a flag, and then it's prohibited. Um, having the flag in the classroom is not. Um, as far as harbor, I'll, I'll say, um, I compliment Harbor uh, for a commitment, and, and all the schools, quite honestly, uh, and I said this last week as well, for committing to making sure that every single kid in this district is seen, heard, valued, and safe. I compliment Harbor and other schools in this district that understand that students in our LGBTQ plus community are two times as likely to attempt suicide, and that this district is obligated morally and statutorily to provide information that helps them. Now, Harbor already, since I've been here, when something was brought to their attention, identified that there was a resource that was inappropriate, and they removed it. But to support students, especially those more likely to try to harm themselves, um, to support them is not inappropriate. So I compliment that staff, and I compliment the other members of this district. I would say about 3,100 adults uh, that are gonna guarantee every day that our kids are seen, heard, valued, and safe. And um, I can't say it any other way than that. <laughs> Thank you. Next, we have community input on agendized items. Trust, uh, Trustee Weigand. This is the opportunity for the public to address the board regarding items on the regular meeting agenda. Comments on agenda items are limited to three minutes per comment, up to 20 minutes per topic. A speaker may not relinquish his or her time to another person. Speaker cards for items on the discussion action calendar may be held until that item is considered by the board if the speaker prefers. First, we have Shelby Feliciano Salba, and then next we have Betsy Fisher. Um, two, oh, you have two minutes because we have quite a few speakers okay. on this topic. Thank I'll you. I'll be quick. Thanks. Um, hi, good evening, uh, President Anderson, Dr. Smith, and the esteemed members of the board. My name is Shelby Feliciano Sabala. I'm the Chief Partnership Officer at Project Hope Alliance. And I'm here to say thank you. Thank you for your partnership and commitment to serving our students experiencing homelessness. What I'd like to do is take the opportunity to walk you through what we've done this year for some of our kids. Um, the first piece is we are providing senior experiences for our seniors. That means senior pictures, prom, dresses, makeup, transportation, cap and gowns, and lays for graduation. These are experiences that all students deserve and our students are getting. Also, our graduation rate for our seniors this year is almost 80%. The national average for students experiencing homelessness is 65%. And I wanna tell you a story about one of our students who was awarded a $50,000 scholarship for STEM in college. Not only did our case manager take her to different colleges, she took her whole family with her to make sure it was an intentional choice for the student and her family. <clears throat> our work is incredibly impactful, not only for our underrepresented students, but their, their entire family and future generations. We are working to end the cycle of homelessness and are appreciative and honored for your partnership. 
We look forward to all the work we will do together in the future, and we're grateful for our on-campus presence that ensures all of our kids feel safe, they feel like they have a sense of belonging, and they feel seen. So we will continue our work in reducing <coughs> chronic absenteeism, ensuring our kiddos graduate, and they are successful and they're able to thrive. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shelby. After Betsy, we have Jinwon Kang and Kas Kong. Hello. Um, first, I want to thank you guys for two things. Um, you listened to my comments at a previous board meeting, and we have Narcan, and we are working on getting the AED um, defibrillators. We had a quick tutorial at our campus, and this is a really good start. Second, I want to thank you so much for approving Marley and Me, a book that I submitted. I'm already working on some lesson plans for that, and I can't wait to um, have the kids laugh and cry with me. <laughs> After all, we know that any book with a picture of a beautiful dog on the cover is filled with valuable lessons um, disguised as shenanigans and unfortunately has the same inevitable ending of what happens to dog books. <laughs> so clearly, um, the interest of students is paramount to you, and you've proven that by investing your time and energy and thoughtful contemplation needed to make these two things happen. I'm here again tonight to ask you again to invest some time and energy and thoughtful consideration to another topic that I believe is good for kids. Please, try to think for a moment about your time in high school and junior high school. Woo, go back. Yes, it was a long time ago. Very long for me. Think about lunch time, the lunch cafeteria. Maybe you remember the movie Mean Girls. Picture it. Maybe you're having a little bit of anxiety right now just picturing high school lunch. Well, you're not alone. A recent article in Psychology Today noted that in the past 30 years, lunchtime anxiety at school has increased 30%. The most dreaded period of the day for a huge, huge swath of students is lunchtime. In fact, a recent study from BYU outlined the fact that for many kids, even the most well-adjusted kids, lunchtime is a source of social anxiety, uncertainty, and often bullying. This same paper con concluded that, quote, loving lunchtime is consistently positively related to a student's sense of belonging. Tonight, I ask you to seriously consider the benefits of having Bridges on our campus. It provides a great support system for many students. Thank you, Betsy. Kids I'm so sorry. Kids who have nowhere to go at lunch. Um, it's just those kids that I send who have nowhere to go at lunch are the ones that you I'd quickly like to thank the board for this opportunity to speak. Uh, my name is Jinwon Kang, and I'm a member of the Bridges Club at Newport Harbor High School. Now, unlike some of my fellow club members who have spent all four years, or will spend all of their four years at Newport Harbor High School, I've only been able to spend two. I transferred them from Georgia. But despite the fact that I've only spent half of my time in high school at Newport Harbor, to say that they were some of the two proudest years of my life would be an absolute understatement. Mm -hmm. And much of that pride can be attributed to my time in Bridges. Bridges, to me, is not just a club that simply conducts business in a classroom after class. It's a vital community, a community that uplifts and unifies the larger collective, taking steps forward together. A community both, oh, both, both I and others have witnessed the good that Bridges has done for our campus. It has allowed for us to foster a space where we can empathize with each other's differences and our commonalities, while also celebrating the unique differences and paths that have made every person themselves. Through it, we have seen not only the merits of our shared experiences, but the diverse personal experiences of each and every person that are simply impossible to replicate. In two years of Bridges, I can only think of the positive impact it has made for both me and the others surrounding me. I have seen the power of people coming forward to share their stories. I have seen, I have seen this change that forms through a continued effort to bring together an entire body. And I have seen the beauty that takes place as we come to understand each other just a little better. Now that I've graduated, I look back on these years with pride. I can only hope that Bridges continues to exist for the sake of future students. For its shining light to be extinguished from the campus would be absolutely devastating. And I can't imagine what our school would look like without it. So I simply ask that Bridges continues to carry on for students going forward, so that they too can experience the community, the support, and the positivity that I also experienced. Thank you. And 
after Cass Addison Blackmore. Good evening. My name is Cass, and tonight I'm here to speak on behalf of Bridges. Before I begin, I want to thank the school board for supporting Bridges and allowing me and others to share our thoughts. I'm not the best at expressing how I feel, but this truly means a lot to me. Thank you for making this possible. From my time in Bridges, I've learned several valuable lessons, including being an advocate and getting involved. There are many ways to support something, but Bridges has taught me the importance of speaking up for what I believe in. If I support something, I should be willing to stand up and be vocal in my support for it. I believe myself and others have also learned to think beyond ourselves and how we can become more involved in our community. We think about how we can help others, not just ourselves, and how we can build bridges to unite people of different backgrounds. But bridges isn't solely about making schools safer and more inclusive. It's also a place where we can connect with others. For me, being in Bridges has been one of the best parts of this past school year. From Miss <coughs> Pogue to my sister Carrie, I've been able to meet and spend time with the most amazing people. Overall, Bridges is a place where teenagers can be, you know, <coughs> teenagers. While Bridges isn't a place for building physical bridges, this club has helped me bridge the gap between what's familiar and what I've never done or feared. In fact, if it weren't for Bridges, I wouldn't be here giving a speech <coughs> for a third time this past school year. While that may not sound like a lot, it was unfathomable to me in August, and honestly, it's still a little hard to believe that I'm here tonight. But I thank you all for giving current and future students a safe space to speak up for and share their beliefs, and thank you for listening. Hello, I'm Addison Blackmore. I joined Bridges my sophomore year. I'm an incoming senior and I've enjoyed every minute of my experience in the program. My sophomore year, I was deeply buried into depression. There were many times I thought of giving up. I eventually joined Bridges after weeks of my friends recommending it and instantly felt a sense of community. My junior year in Bridges, I became a lot more involved and active. I participated in more activities outside my school day. I felt cared for and heard for by everyone. People I've connected with inside this program are so friendly and make sure your voice is heard. This program does a lot of things that connect all students at our school. A few years, a few events, including our yearly Mix It Up at lunch, the OC Human Relations Bridges Walk in My Shoes Youth <coughs> Conference, and writing an art contest. Bridges is a program I would recommend to every single student at my school. It's a place that accepts you for you. It promotes kindness and education. This year, we even had mental health days during lunch as AP tests and finals were approaching. We hosted a variety of activities to give some students a break, such as drawing, bracelet making, Legos, coloring, and origami. Some days included presentations that showed healthy ways to cope and study with during this busy time of the year. It alleviated some stress from not only the students, but also the faculty who have dedicated their time to help their students as much as possible. This lunch allowed students to distress and enjoy themselves in a period of chaos. This year with Bridges was so inspirational, I even signed up for the Youth Leadership Institute for a long day period for a day long program over the summer, it teaches students how to become more inclusive and understanding leaders. I look forward to it and have only heard positive things about it from past participants. This program is a fundamental part of our school and we need this program to continue in order to keep it the safety, respect, and understanding aspect of our school intact. Thank you for your time and consideration. Please keep this program alive. It's a very important part of many people's lives. Next, we have Ya Mara Alatore. And then following that, we have Anahi uh, Mojica. Hello, my name is Ya Mara Alatore. As a third member of my family to take part of the Newport Harbor Bridges program, I would like to stand here today and thank you for approving the program. Once again, Bridges has created an environment of welcomeness and prosperity for me to grow in. My siblings now, 24 and 25, talk about Bridges in an incredibly positive positive light with no regrets of joining it. I began working with Ms. Pogue at the age of seven, learning that school is for everyone, no matter what they look like or where they come from. Since a child, this idea has stuck in my head and it is a virtue I continue carrying into my adolescence. As a young, awkward freshman, Bridges offered sanctuary. As a sophomore, Bridges offered me leadership as I work with OC Human Relations in their Youth Leadership Program Institute. In my junior year, Bridges gave me a home when I didn't have one in my own after my father passed away. I hope that in my senior year, Bridges will continue to serve as that safe harbor. 
One of my favorite things Bridges hosted this year was our Common Crafts event. This event was created by students for the students in need of relax relaxation during a period of stress and disorder. There were threats of school shootings, and on top of that, there were AP and IV <coughs> exams, one of the most stress-inducing times of the academic school year. Bridges opens our doors to kids who need it, and need it the most, and leaves a positive impact on students by not only educating them on things that they do to help themselves, but also their community. Bridges isn't just a club, but a family, one I really don't want to see go. Bridges, with the help of Bridges, I worked with an OC Human Relations. I have been given the encouragement to be the change in the world and not wait for other people, as well as the fact that Bridges has offered me more than $3,000 in scholarships to attend university, and taking this program away would take away that opportunity for other students. So thank you for your time. Thank you. After Anahi, Sabrina Schaefer. Hi. Um, good afternoon. My name is Anahi Mujica, and I am a rising senior at Nipah Harbor this fall. Throughout the two years that I've been part of Bridges, I have been able to learn various values that have helped me as a young adult. Thanks to this program, I've gained experiences that have contributed to my growth, not only as a student, but also as an individual outside of school. In Bridges, I am always given the opportunity to make a positive impact on my school, campus, and community as well. I am able to contribute in creating a welcoming and supportive environment for all groups. Bridges has provided me with opportunities to develop my leadership and teamwork skills, being able to lead projects, share my ideas, and then being heard and taken into consideration gives me a sense of belonging. Being able to build friendships and connect with people that may have different backgrounds or identities and ideas has taught me to be respective and more supportive of them. From building friendships with all the types of people, I've learned a sense of empathy. Bridges has definitely taught me what the word inclusivity really means and the important role it plays within us. Empowering these skills helps a person feel comfortable and be themselves without feeling judged. Lastly, I've gained a deeper understanding of why it is important to treat each other with respect and ultimately <coughs> help over overcome biases. Those are some of the many reasons of why Bridges is an important program that needs to be, al needs to be kept alive for the following years. It's a program where a person can easily grow and learn many things that can be used in our everyday life. Thank you so much for supporting this extremely valuable program. After Sabrina is Rafael Arias Torres. Good evening, members of the school board, faculty, and distinguished guests. My name is Sabrina Schieffer, and I'm a rising senior at Newport Harbor High School who's been a member of Bridges since freshman year. I entered high school as an anxious and shy student who was petrified to speak to my classmates, let alone a large group of people. Yet my time spent with Bridges has allowed me to blossom into a rising senior who can say they've helped facilitate school-wide campaigns and involvement. I've also been avid to take advantage of the Human Relations Ambassadors Program, an internship designed to provide advanced human tr relations training and skills to diverse Orange County youth. I've been a participant for two years, and not only did I grow close to many passionate students, but I worked alongside them to develop campaigns on voter suppression and fostering empathy in our communities. I also participated in the Youth Leadership Institute last summer, and I can say without a doubt it was the absolute highlight. Besides my own personal growth, the program has opened my eyes to the importance of inclusion. Weekly, I get to interact with people on campus from grades, genders, ethnicities, and identities differing from my own. This encapsulates the heart of Bridges, a place where students are, a are able to gather and celebrate their uniqueness and, by extension, improve their campus. I'm, in I'm exposed to an eclectic group of like-minded peers who come with their own unique philosophies on life. While we share differences in identity, we are weaved together through a shared thread of empathy. I find when I'm surrounded by such people, I'm able to reflect on my own ideals and continue to work together to be change makers in our community. Our partnership with OC Human Relations is vital to continue to create a more inclusive space on campus where students can not only feel supported, but feel the empowerment to be a leader in their community. We have been able to implement impactful initiatives and foster a culture of acceptance and understanding. 
By maintaining this partnership, we ensure that future generations of students will have the opportunity to experience the same journey that I have been fortunate to embark on. Thank you for your time. And after Raphael is Debbie Polk. Hello, board members and other NMUSD faculty and public audience. My name is Rafael Arias Torres, and I am a 2019 graduate from Newport Harbor High School, and I am currently attending Northeastern University in Boston. During my time at Newport Harbor, I was the school's board representative. So I used to speak to some of you in this very spot <laughs> years ago, talking about the happenings at the school. One reoccurring event that I would always discuss with the board was the Mix It Up at Lunch events held by Bridges. These events were by far the most popular events held by the program and the most memorable for me. Not only did I have the privilege to lead the event, um, but also participated in it numerous times. The event was composed of quick conversations with unfamiliar faces to get to know people outside your direct circle of friends. I still remember the many fun facts I learned, the laughs I shared, and the new friends I, I made at the event. But if I'm being honest, the biggest takeaway from the event for me was the community we were able to foster. And seeing all the smiles on my peers' faces made the experience 100 times better. Where else would I be able to see hundreds of my peers mingling together, listening to each other, and understanding new and different perspectives? Bridges is only possible through your support, so I'd like to thank the board for giving OC Human Relations the opportunity and privilege to help foster this equitable community the past 20 years, and hopefully many more. Without the support of OC Human Relations, a lot of the necessary components that makes Bridges Bridges will not be able to happen. During my time, Kathy Tran was our OC Human Re human relations representative, and she taught me so many leadership skills, the correct way of listening, and the importance of empathy in all aspects of life. The knowledge that OC Human Relations brings to Newport Harbor is abundant, and allows for the club to have difficult conversations in order to create a plan on how to ta best tackle these situations in real life. None of these life skills that Bridges teaches would be possible without the help of OC Human Relations. I can now say, four years after graduating, the Bridges program has shaped me into a better person, and I am for forever grateful for that. Thank you. Good evening, President Anderson, trustees, and Superintendent Smith. In April, the Surgeon General put out a report on the damaging effects of loneliness. In it, he discusses that at any moment, about one out of every two Americans experience loneliness, which cause grave consequences for our mental and physical health. When students are socially disconnected, it can increase their risk of anxiety and depression and worsen their performance in school. He recommends that schools develop a plan for connectedness through the implementation of peer-led programs and partnerships with key community organizations, as well as create a supportive school environment that fosters belonging through peer groups that allow students to lean on and learn from each other's experiences. Newport Harbor High School is well on its way to combating this epidemic of loneliness because for the past 20 years, through our partnership with OC Human Relations, we have fostered community through the Bridges program on campus. I have been the advisor of Bridges for 18 years and have witnessed firsthand the positive impact it has on students and school culture. In simplest terms, Bridges provides a home for students, a space for them to connect with their peers and be respected, a forum where they are heard through our open leadership board. Unlike other clubs, students do not have to be elected to be a leader on campus. In Bridges, they simply need to choose to be a leader, which means that all students have a voice. Over the years, the students have lovingly coined our motto of bringing unity to the sailor community. And that is exactly what they do. They plan and facilitate events that foster belonging on campus, events that are created by students for students. One example is our annual Mix It Up at Lunch Speed Friendships event, where students get to know others they might not talk to otherwise. At this event, you can see students who have recently immigrated here practice their English with star athletes, and students who are neurodivergent forge relationships with club leaders. This interconnectedness is what Bridges is all about and what can be witnessed in every one of our meetings. We are grateful for your support of this program and the support of our Education Foundation and the parents in it. Because of that support, we have received a Distinguished School Award twice for the work that our Bridges program has done, and we are eager to continue making a difference. In the words of the Surgeon General, this will take all of us. We're happy to play our part and we appreciate yours as well. Thank you. Thank you. And Debbie, just thank you also for bringing your students and preparing them so well. It's really hard to change, I know, from three minutes to two minutes and you all did that eloquently and really well. So thank you very much. 
Um, next up, we have Laura Mariquin, and following that, we have Julie Dudrich. Well, I, that is a hard act to follow, <laughs> and I really think we should have that club on every single campus here. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, um, my name is Laura Marlquin, and I'm coming to you today to talk about the Estancia High School Theater. I am a member of the Measure F um, Committee who oversees the bond funds, and I also have been on the steering team that has been um, working with the theater uh, uh, progression for the last five years I've been on it. So uh, this is the third time I have come to speak in front of the board about the theater, and I have to admit, I am rather frustrated. I am frustrated that the board changed the location of the theater last July because um, we have yet to break ground. And had the board stayed on course with the agreed upon spot that was voted on in 2019, we would actually have a completed theater by now. So instead of celebrating this project right now, we are asking that you go ahead and approve the new contract with Swindler 10 after um, our other contractor pulled out. My question for you today, though, is what happens if Swindler 10 can't stay by the guaranteed maximum price after, after the DSA approval comes in? So I suppose that would mean that we would have more delays and, of course, more money. The theater project um, is now estimated to cost $42 million. When this project was approved in 2019, the budget was estimated at $31 million. Goodness, what wonderful projects could have been paid for with the additional funds that we now must spend on this theater. So this theater needs to be built. You know it's way overdue, but it's vital that we move forward and that you don't waver from your commitment to this project. And I just ask that those constituents, those uh, board members that, who did vote to move the theater, that when you're asked why it is so expensive and why it is taking so long, that you will own up to those decisions you made. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, it's good to see a lot of you. I'm sorry that I'm here today as a uh, as a community member, as a employee within the district, um, and most importantly, as a parent of a drama student at Estancia High School who will not see the, um, the uh, theater built. Um, as an alum to Estancia as well, this project has been discussed for many, many years, and I just found out it was um, scrapped yesterday and shocked, um, which is what brought me here today. So I echo what Laura has just said. Um, regardless of how much it's gonna cost, which is a big asking, it just needs to be finished. I just kind of wanted to follow up and, and not to squash Corona Del Mar, because former students of mine, um, and I'm so excited for their CAPI Awards. Um, if they were performing at Estancia in their theater, current theater, it, they probably would not have had those awards. <coughs> so just looking for equitability throughout the district, Estancia is the only high school that does not have a theater right now. So thank you. <laughs> Three minutes. Rosie. Um, just related to the theater, we're going to have comment on that after the next report, so please don't leave because we are going to address that. Next, we have um, item 17, achievement, the report on LCFF, which stands for the Local Control Funding Formula. The local performance indicator is for the California State Dashboard. Ms. Gailey and Ms. Shields. Yes, thank you. So tonight we present to the board the second half of the LCFF. Thank you for spelling out the acronym, President Anderson. The LCFF presentation for the community. There are two parts last time. For those who uh, were with us or would like to go back and watch the video, 
was more the dashboard and the hard data. This is the local indicators and the one we get to choose ourselves. Vanessa will go into the review of ourselves and then later tonight we'll vote on the LCAP itself. Yes, thank you. Uh, President Anderson, Superintendent Smith, members of the board, cabinet, and public. Tonight we bring before you the local performance indicator report, which is required to be presented at the same uh, evening as the uh, LCAP approval. The local indicators are around local data that cannot be found uh, on the dashboard through other means. So for instance, um, when you look at the uh, English language arts assessment results or suspension rates or absenteeism, those things can be found in the state data. But some things can only be reported locally. And so these five areas of the state priorities are what we report on. You'll be able to find the information on the California Schools Dashboard. Currently, the 2022 report reflects the 21-22 outcomes presented last year. And you can see at the top the date, and then at the bottom um, the other areas that will be presented this evening. But you won't actually see the evening's report until around uh, January. That's when they do the next cycle. Um, the report, however, will be posted on our website. So this actual report will be posted on our district plans website, along with our local control accountability plan and uh, the other plan that we're presenting this evening. Local performance indicators. Uh, the requirement of the district is that we measure progress uh, on our locally uh, available information, and then we report the results to the public and to the board. And then lastly, we determine whether we have uh, met or not met the requirement for two years. So the requirement is to measure, and then to report, and then we will have satisfied or met the requirement. So state priority one is around the basic conditions of learning. These are also areas of the Williams settlement. And it's about assigning appropriate, uh, appropriately assigning teachers, having access to uh, aligned curriculum and instructional materials, and then having safe, clean, and functional school facilities. Um, this information is reported for each school on the school accountability report card. Every school in California has one. And uh, parents and families can access this information through our website. Um, every school has a SARC, school accountability report card, and we report on the uh, teacher assignments. Um, in this report, we're reporting on 21-22 data as the state is making it available for the public. And again, um, what we're reporting on is that we, out of all the teachers in all of Newport Mesa land, we only had two misassignments of teachers for English learners two total misassignments and two vacant teacher positions as it's reported there. Mm -hmm. We also have all students um, have access to um, uh, standards aligned curriculum and instructional materials to um, have at school and at home. There are zero numbers of identified instances where facilities don't meet the good repair standard. There's a facilities inspection tool conducted annually. All of our schools either meet the good or exemplary mark and again if pe people are interested in their school's outcomes they need to look at their school accountability report card. We measured it, we report it, we've met requirement one. For state priority two, there are five different areas. We're looking at professional learning, we're looking at aligned instructional materials, we're looking at how we're um, supporting improved instruction, we're looking at other academic standards beyond just English, language arts, math, history, science, and then what kind of support um, teachers and administrators are provided. And the way that we measure this is through looking at a self-reflection tool on a scale of one to five, from exploration research all the way to full implementation and sustainability. So in the first area, which is professional learning around academic standards and or curriculum frameworks, this is around the professional learning in each of these areas. The blue box represents the results that we had from last year, and the X represents current year. So what you can see is in uh, English language arts and English language development on our self-rating tool last year, we were at the level three, and uh, this year we've moved up to the level four. And again, going back, the uh, four we consider full implementation, three is initial implementation. Oftentimes we were kind of at 3.4 or 3.7, so we had to make a judgment call. The thing to keep in mind in a unified district is that we have many different perspectives on what implementation looks like. And while we may have one level of implementation at elementary, it might look differently at secondary. And so we really have to think about that as an overall rating. So again, we're looking at um, the fours in the English language arts, English language math, uh, sorry, English language arts and English language development. In mathematics, um, we're looking at our solid three. Um, we're really excited about looking to next year and doing an uh, elementary math pilot. It's been a little while. Um, we've had a more recent adoption for grades six and above, and though we really think that by doing that, we're gonna propel ourselves forward on that full implementation, uh, implementation category. Something else that really hindered our professional learning abilities was the lack of subs. And so as I mentioned at the last meeting, 
we've leveraged our educator effectiveness funds to be able to get us a floater teacher team to do professional development release that we can count on. And we also really think that's going to support and feed us into a, a full implementation status. We use information from our November uh, needs assessment, our staff survey, which we will do again. And we really want to highlight the work that we've done in elementary around thinking maps, around using the Hegarty curriculum for phonemic awareness and uh, next year for phonics. And then really the work that we've done with the science of reading. And um, we think that those are key areas in propelling us forward. We also know that we'll be doing a lot of professional development to support adoptions in uh, elementary for history social studies, um, for math, um, they're doing a pilot in science and so it's been a long time since we've looked at science standards with elementary and it's been a long time since we've looked at history standards with elementary but it's on the horizon and that again is reflected in our self-reflection tool um, on this topic. In terms of the instructional materials, um, this is the extent to which um, they, have, they are aligned and available in classrooms. And so um, you're seeing a, a reflection of recent adoptions and moving forward with future <coughs> adoptions. Um, and again, uh, a nod to um, the next gen science standards. They're so very different from our previous standards. And especially in elementary, we really think that these new materials are going to um, uh, really propel the kids forward. Uh, we do an annual sufficiency report in October with a resolution that all kids will have access to standards aligned materials. Again, uh, a nod to the pilots that will go on, a secondary science pilot, and then looking at the implementations K6 with the history social studies and 7-8 with the ELA adoption we anticipate this evening. In terms of policy and program support, this is really looking at the structures that we have in place to support elevating our, our um, instructional program. And so when we're thinking about that, it's things like our early release or our late start times where teachers are able to collaborate or we're able to bring in professional development. We have secondary instructional coaches at all of our schools really able to embed on the job training and support. Again, we have our survey. We have both push in and co-teaching models in special ed and general education, and we also have some principal classroom walkthroughs that have been happening primarily at secondary, but we're looking to hopefully see what the possibilities are at elementary to really make sure that our instructional leaders are in tune with what instruction looks like across the district and how we can continue to have best practices shine. And in terms of implementing other academic standards, our career technical education, our PE, our VAPA, our world language, again, we're all really looking at, um, at, at that full implementation level, thinking about the um, CTE, career technical education, and uh, the alignment to the model curriculum and state standards. We're so proud of all of our specialists, but especially our elementary specialists, and thinking about the work that they do to allow a wide uh, access to a variety of uh, PE activities. And again, same thing with our visual and performing arts. Of course, we love our science specialists, but they're on the other set of standards. Oh, and I, we do want to mention our um, teacher on special assignment support. Um, we have a robust uh, team of teachers on special assignment, and we are looking to expand them for next year at the secondary level. Um, lastly, we're looking at the support for our teachers and administrators and really thinking about how we're looking at the needs of a whole staff, of individual teachers, and then really thinking about some areas where some teachers may be struggling and how we can continue to support them. One of the things we're particularly proud of is our P3 preschool for third grade literacy team and the work that we've done there to um, bring the principals together. I believe we have seven of them. And then um, different district administrators and teachers on special assignment, our reading specialists. I mean, really trying to support the principals in knowing what to look for and how to propel our learning forward there. And of course, the staff surveys and forums that we hold to hear um, the voices of our constituents. And then lastly, again, the TOSAs and the instructional coaches. So we measured and reported, and we will have met for state two. And now we're looking at state priority three, which is about parent and family engagement in the three areas of building relationships, building partnerships, and seeking input. The state gives us a survey, a reflection tool, so their guiding questions are what we use um, to, to focus on our self-ratings. And um, we're really thinking about building uh, relationships, having welcoming environments and welcoming communication, making sure that there is access to translation and interpretation. Um, when we think about participation, we think about PTA, PTO, our different activities, foundations, um, but also um, just a variety of family groups and boosters that are uh, on our campuses. When we're thinking about supporting family learning, we're also thinking about workshops and ways to learn about what kids are learning in school and then also their social emotional learning and their growth as little humans. And then lastly, decision making. We look to our advisory groups to be invitational in a place where families either elected or just who want to participate can come and learn about the school decision making process and provide input on our programs. 
So uh, we did our annual local control and accountability plan survey, which we talked about last week. And again, um, we want everyone to take it next year, so we're looking to more than double our participants. But of the people who responded, we got really high ratings in terms of people understanding their children's report card, of feeling like they could discuss the progress with their teachers, being fe uh, feeling welcome at school, knowing that they have um, communication from the school and then also that the information is helpful, and again, that the, the school is responsive. So all high ratings, 80% or above. <coughs> and then here, we're looking at our self-rating on the, the building relationships. So the, the prompts are on the left, our ranking is on the right, and what we wanted to do is highlight um, really looking at those welcoming environments and our progress in developing the two-way communication, um, and so those are highlighted in green. Uh, the others are the same level as we, we felt like we had last year. We know we have some areas to grow. We're extremely excited about uh, our Christy Flores joining our partnerships and really helping us to, to bring together um, some of our best practices. Um, knowing how great communication was at Davis, we really think that we can um, take it to the next level. We have programs for parents and families. We have things like a parent education series. We have the virtual learning. We have Grupo Crescer, um, delivered in Spanish, and principally for our Spanish-speaking families. And then we also have elementary site-based academic behavior and mental health workshops. It really depends on what the, what the parents and families need at each school. And um, an example of uh, our responsiveness this year was providing um, training on fentanyl at each of our schools, recognizing um, the uptick in incidents and thinking that we need to respond. Um, so that's another area where um, we, we really want to point to that site-based um, process. And then these results show um, the, the extent to which families agree with having um, information to support their children's learning at home. So you can see English language development and reading high on the list, um, a little bit uh, less so in science. And then in engineering, which is always a tricky one because families are like, are they doing it? So uh, we want to make sure that we're, we're helping families understand when they're uh, learning about engineering. Um, but you can see that uh, over 50% in almost all the categories believe that they're getting the, the support that they need uh, to learn about their core areas. And then on the other uh, column, what you see is uh, agreement uh, around being encouraged to participate, encouraged to join PTA or PFO, encouraged to take part in the parent ed series. Um, so knowing that it's there. Not everybody can get there, although we are trying to make it convenient, we're trying to make it accessible, we have uh, babysitting whenever possible, um, and we want to make sure families understand um, that they are welcome to enjoy uh, the school site council meetings four or five times a year. They're always needed. So in terms of building partnerships, you can see some of the prompts here around building capacity and thinking about um, providing uh, at-home learning, uh, highlighting that, that we think that we're at a pretty good full implementation given the ratings and given all the resources that we're making available. Um, and then also knowing that there are some areas for us to improve, specifically around thinking about um, understanding uh, legal rights, helping families understand how to access support, um, and then thinking about how we can continue to work together to elevate student um, progress. So um, we can have great conferences, but how do we also continue to parlay that into action? And so you see uh, also some responses in terms of our District English Learner Advisory Committee and our English Learner Advisory Committee, our Community Advisory Committee, <coughs> making sure we, we represent that every family is invited to participate. And again, really pointing to um, this piece here about school site council, um, knowing that you're invited, but then also hoping everybody shows up and participates. So we feel like that's a, a pretty good, strong uh, representation of full implementation and really trying to have input on policies and programs. Um, and we, we know that we, again, have some work to do around the capacity building of making sure people not only are invited, but then participate and feel heard. And then lastly, we do really uh, want to work on um, co-creating the activities and co-creating um, the events and making sure that you know, those workshops are meaningful um, to all of our constituents. School climate, so we are required to administer a local climate survey at least every other year to students in these key grade spans. California Healthy Kids satisfies that requirement. It was administered not only in every other year, but we've administered it at 21, 22, 22, 23, and the year prior. And the three areas that we look at, there's probably 80 different data points you could pull from the report, but um, the main uh, threads that we look at are school connectedness, caring adults, <coughs> and high expectations. Uh, one of the things that we want to highlight are the response rates. We really hope for an 85% response rate. You'll see that we didn't meet that in uh, many of the grade levels, particularly fifth grade. Um, there is uh, the ability, in all transparency, we always want to know that families have a right to know what's going on. You can see all the questions are posted on the California Healthy Kids Survey. The forms are made available. And 
And so I think you see a, a reflection of participation, um, but you also then have to think about that when you're looking at the overall results. So the prompts listed here are things like, do you feel close to people at school? And this is all about school connectedness. Are you happy to be here? Do you feel like you're part of this school? And then students uh, rank their levels of agreement. And so by grade span, you can see our 21, 22, and 22, 23, and then the, the delta, the change, up or down. This is in response to requests that were made last year and wanting to know, well, how do we compare to prior year? So you can see, again, uh, minimal um, down in fifth grade, and then up seventh, and again, up in eighth, but again, thinking about response rates and just kind of taking all of that in, knowing too that this is a school by school administration. So really if people are wanting to make meaning of it, you have to look at, at the school level to really understand what it means um, in terms of um, your child. In terms of caring adults, the questions are like, do, you, do the teachers and other grown-ups at school care about you? Do they listen when you have something to say? And so again, you'll see a minimal change. Um, you'll see a little bit up in ninth grade, a little bit down in 11th and 7th, and a little bit down in 5th. In terms of high expectations, um, do the teachers and other grown-ups at school tell you when you do a good job? Do the teachers and other grown-ups believe that you can do a good job, et cetera? And so um, these are the results, thinking that it's pretty, pretty similar. Um, an increase in seventh and ninth grade, which is a, a good thing to see, and then uh, slightly down in fifth and 11th. So we satisfied that requirement. Last one is the uh, State Priority 7 course access, and this is really about having um, access to a broad course of study. And so uh, I'll outline that for you in a little bit, and making sure that not only do we talk about access for all students, but for some students who have uh, unique needs, um, and for um, the unduplicated students, so typically low income and English learner. How do we look at that? We look at our graduation rates, and we use the five-year cohort outcome. We look at how many students are meeting what's called the A to G requirements, or UC and CSU. We look at our career technical education pathway offerings and how they are uh, meeting completion. And lastly, our visual and performing arts opportunities. So a broad course of study in elementary is um, as listed above, and it is our default instructional program. And again, we provide this in the context of our regular classroom, but we also have additional specialists to amplify and support what's already happening in the regular classroom. Um, so they get access to both uh, to PE and science through the teacher of record as well as the specialists. So all of our students have access to this broad course of study in elementary. And then secondary, again, um, broad courses study the English, history, math, science, PE, applied arts, foreign language, VAPA, and CTE. And something that we're very proud of is the increase. The five-year cohort increased in all aspects in looking at graduation rates and in meeting UC and CSU requirements. Um, all students, English learners, low income, and students with disabilities, and again, Based on your feedback last year, we provided the delta. And um, one thing we do want to point out is um, for English learners, it, it gives people pause when they look at the number and say, oh, wow, 24% meeting UC and uh, CSU. But please recall that if you're still an English learner in high school, either you're newly arrived or something's happening that is preventing the language skills for a student from being able to, um, to reclassify. And typically that's passing at grade level in certain assessments. And so it is more difficult for an English learner to meet the A to G in the CSU because they're still working on their language skills. So one thing that I always encourage people to do is look at the reclassified student rates as well. Um, but know that again, our English learners are graduating at high rates. And so we wanna make sure that we're um, making note that they're getting a quality education, but um, the outcome is different when it comes to um, A to G. For our career technical education um, and VAPA, we're so pleased about the many pathways that we offer, um, the robust uh, pathway and opportunity for our kids. Um, we are really pleased that we had 12.4%, um, uh, 216 students in our CTE completers. They continue to grow. Last year, as a comparison, we had 10.6% um, and 186 students. And then we have a lot of secondary VAPA classes. I want to remind people that we do things on the semester. So this is 287 classes together between first and second semester. Some things are one semester only and some things are, are two semesters. So this is an increase uh, from last year, which I believe was at about 225. This gives you a visual. We have an amazing website. I'd encourage our families, particularly families of elementary kiddos, to check out what is to come. Um, but we have uh, all of these different um, pathways offered in the various zones. And each of those little toggles is um, clickable so that you can learn more. And there are videos and um, information. Um, so we really want to make sure that families are learning about um, the pathways so that students can access them as soon as they hit middle and high school. 
So when we're thinking about the broad course of study for English learner students, we're really thinking about what are we doing to provide core content access and then what are we doing to elevate the um, language. And so designated ELD is the time for language uh, learning at the student's proficiency level. Whereas other times of the day, students are to be with their peers, their typical peers, so they can be working on their language. Um, so that remainder of instruction is with their English only and reclassified, our FEP peers with regular um, ongoing access in the broad course of study. Remember, everybody gets PE and music. We want to make sure all of our kiddos get that. And then for students with an IEP, anybody with mild to moderate disabilities are included in classrooms with their age level peers. We uh, really love and embrace inclusive practices in our district. Students with moderate to severe disabilities are provided their broad course of study through an adopted unique learning systems and in, any, um, in an appropriate setting designated by their IEP. So we include to the extent possible, but we also recognize that students' needs come first and they're articulated in their learning plans. As a district, we are to identify the barriers to providing access to a broad course of study. An ongoing challenge continues to be students who have multiple Fs. If there's one F, then you can make up that F pretty quickly. When students have compounded with four and five Fs at a time, it is challenging for them to remediate those credits, get the learning, and then also maintain the ongoing learning at their level at that time. So that is a challenge. And then we have very grading and practice, homework practices throughout the district, and that's something that we want to continue to look at what can be standard and what can be unique. And then um, lastly, we also are cognizant of students who are newcomers and the significant challenges that they face in learning the schooling system and thinking about the gaps in their learning and thinking about while they're learning basic instructional skills in English, how can we also then complement with content area learning? And so that is um, something that we have to recognize when we have newcomers. So um, how does this inform our local control and accountability plan? We keep on doing the things that we think are important, which is having that default program for our elementary kids, providing as much access as possible, providing A to G aligned courses of study so secondary students can matriculate through, continue to provide these robust CTE pathways, and then when students are struggling, intervene. Think about pushing in, thinking about secondary intervention, having our credit recovery, tutorial support, having our <laughs> summer school, which by the way, for secondary, started today. Right? So doing all that we can to provide uh, summer remediation, but also enrichment. Um, lastly, in informing the LCAP and thinking about um, in English learners, or second to last. Um, we have intensive designated English language development. We provide integrated language development in our content areas. And we really are looking at the co-teach model and expansion to make sure that um, we're really providing as much access as possible. And when we're thinking about students with an IEP, we again are thinking about the inclusive practices, having regular special ed staffing, using both the push-in and the pull-out models, and really leaning into the collaboration between general education and special education, because um, it really is about having um, kids learning together to the extent possible. And so, we've measured, we've reported, and we determined that we have met the requirements for this year's local performance indicators. Any questions? Trustee Bartow. Um, I have a, a few questions. Um, so I'll start at the beginning of the slide and work my way towards the end of the presentation. Um, for the beginning of the Next Generation Science Standards, mm -hmm. can you talk about uh, maybe why we're just getting to those or what those look like going mm -hmm. forward? Yes. So well before the pandemic, when we were looking at our adoptions, we knew that in elementary we needed to adopt both English language arts and math. And so that was the priority. And so those two things were adopted at the same time, which is unique. You don't hear of other districts doing that. So in 1617, those two sets of materials were adopted. And then we had to work through the implementation. So when we got to 1920, we were starting to look at branching out to other areas. Um, and then something happened in March. 2020, and that put everything on hold. And so we had to put uh, all of the adoptions on hold until pretty recently. And so we've just picked that up again. And um, history was the, the first one that we needed to do, and science came on its heels. So the science adoption committee um, has convened, and they're starting to look at materials to then um, look toward uh, piloting in the fall. But it was just one of those things that English language arts and math had to take precedence. And the science adoption, the curriculum adoption that we're looking at today, that relates into the pilot in the fall? That is not about elementary. That okay. is about grades yes, seven and eight, secondary. I believe. Looking at yes, my, that's a middle yeah. school and uh, secondary adoption. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, all right, and then math, do we, or is still an initial implementation, do we think will be done next year? What, 
Um, well, el elementary is the factor there. Yeah, mathematics um, kind of stalled out a little bit. Um, some of our results have reflected that. And so um, in, in looking toward the new materials, it's not about the materials. It's about all the whole package, right, about re-looking at the standards and then looking at the material and then looking at the instructional moves that the teacher is making. <coughs> and so we really think that by bundling all of that together, um, elementary is just going to take off. We've seen the fruit of our labor really realized in, um, in language arts and in reading uh, specifically, and so we're feeling really good about it, um, but I think the curriculum adoption will help with that. Okay, thank you. That's, I'm glad that it's nice to hear that we're using data to be responsive. That's really great. Um, noticing that fifth grade has got a lot of challenges across the board on the Healthy Kids Survey in mm -hmm. terms of feeling welcome. Do we have any plans to address that? I don't know specifically about fifth grade. I think I need to talk to Sarah Coley um, about what the, what the plans are. Just um, one of the things that we are doing is uh, looking at a, a fresh start on um, PBIS and really thinking about just what are we what are we looking at, at post pandemic now that everything has calmed down. So and we've been given the direction to um, to kind of relaunch and just take a whole nother look at that. So I think that you start with the foundational behavioral expectations and supports, right? And then from there you start to look at what needs to be done as a tier two and a tier three. So as mentioned in our last week, our, our approach is all some few. So we want to make sure that we're taking the broad strokes on tier one. And then as kids are struggling, then we look at tier two and then finally tier three. Thank you. And then last question um, for the UCCSU requirements. Do we have an idea if those students are then matriculating into CTE programs? So do, we, do we kind of know what, what's happening to those students? I don't know about the college going rates piece of it. I know that's been a challenge in years past with the state because you can get information on anybody who goes to CSU and UC. You're relying on kids to report if they go anywhere outside of that system. So um, I'm not um, up to date on um, where we are on that. So while well, you're correct in that we don't necessarily track the data or receive the persistence data, while they're with us and while students who may be English learners or not necessarily 100% A to G are receiving a um, rich, engaging opportunity to participate in coursework such as CTE. Um, we also offer our dual enrollment courses to any student who feels that they're capable in achieving those courses. Um, and so you'll see for that particular data set, even at early college, where we have students who are English learners but feel they have the ability to do and persist, um, have been able to achieve, and they fall into that small percentage that she shared in one of her slides. I think it was like 24% have a college going rate. But we understand that, and so when we start to see a student um, as an upperclassman who might not make the A to G rate to be able to provide them other opportunities so they also can be um, OCC ready, in our case, community college ready. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Great questions. Uh, Trustee Murphy. Um, yes, no thanks, this was great. Um, I guess it, it's sort of related, but um, on the focus area for improvement where you talked about programs for parents and families, and there's parent education series, the Grupo Crisere, thank you, uh, elementary site-based academic behavior and mental health workshops. So so I, the one thing I didn't see in this, and um, it's certainly come, come up uh, a lot recently, is special education communication, uh, more communication with families with special needs with special ed is were you talking about that under the behavior category or I didn't I didn't see it called out anywhere in the <coughs> and maybe it's not specifically supposed to be in this report mm -hmm. but is that something you're thinking about looking at that more special ed I think we're thinking about all of it. Mm -hmm. I think that we're, what we're look, trying to do is make sure that um, all of our families know that they're invited, that they're, they're feeling engaged. Um, what, a few years ago, we partnered on our parent education series to incorporate both the, the special ed uh, and the, the gen ed. And so I think that that will continue. I understand that CAC is also interested in um, maybe having some additional um, support on the parent ed side. Yeah, because so, we, we used to see more on the CAC, and I have not seen a whole mm -hmm, lot on mm -hmm. it recently. Yeah, I think in terms of two-way communication, we're really thinking about that communication plan. And so thinking about that streamlining aspect, making sure that we're providing digital access, we're providing in-person access, that we're providing the, the emails and the phone calls, but in a way that's inviting to our families and that's sort of that more tier one. But that's feedback that has been shared with us in terms of air, accessing our ARIES system or our Blackboard system or whatever system and making sure that we're not having system fatigue. So I think in this particular context, we talked about that. 
Trustee Wigand. This is great. Thank you so much for, for presenting this. Um, I know on slide, I think, 36, identifying, identifying barriers to providing access to broad course of study, one of your bullets said varied grading and homework practices throughout the district. Uh, that is true as we're looking at, you know, um, homeworks, uh, grading, instructions. How are we um, going forward trying to uniform those um, throughout our various schools? Well, I can start. I think that's one of the grassroots and grass top efforts. I mean, that is, that's really the harmony across the entire district. So it is the clarity of the adoptions and the standards and the expectations. It's the training and support teachers get to be able to have common tools. And then it's the, both the standardization of what we're doing and the freedom to do what the class they have in front of them needs right. to reach the goals we all set together. So it, you know, they call it the art and science of teaching for a reason, and it's because there are some st things that are kind of steadfast, and there does need to be room for the individualization that happens in that classroom in that moment as teachers are making those micro decisions. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of it is about why we value collaboration, that, that time to calibrate together about what is an A, what does passing this standard look like, what does high level rigor look like in these areas. That comes through conversation, through looking at student work examples, all of those things together, and that's what our professional development days have really been invested in. So for example, in November, uh, Dr. Hernandez structured where teachers were looking at student writing samples together, and that's really <coughs> a depth of being able to say, oh, I see how this student is performing and why this is a passing grade. And so that's what we're trying to do both at the district level, but also at the staff level where they have time on their Wednesdays, whether it's a late start, early start, asterisk the two who don't have that, but <laughs> where, where we use that time together because it's so independent most of the time when we have that time together to really look across anchored in standards, anchored in student work, what does passing this look like? What does good look like to us? And those professional level conversations. But it's always kind of a, like a, um, a, an accordion, if you would, where it's just trying to find the melody to make that go. Thank you, Timmy. Yes, and I think that's um, really important so that, you know, we don't hear, so community members throughout Newport Mesa feel confident going to their neighborhood school. So I think that is, um, really important, um, but also, you know, with homework practices, um, I know that that varies from, from grade to grade, and, and like Very you said, so. does that vary also from, you know, what that class can handle and not handle, that kind of thing, is the art of teaching you were saying? Mm -hmm. That's really how, okay. Well, and the idea that the learning sh is happening in class, and yeah. it's practice happening as homework, and kind of how we do that, and teachers are always looking to find the balance between you know, elementary when there's one teacher, maybe two with science, but one teacher who's assigning all the homework. And then secondary has a different type of balance when you have multiple teachers all assigning their own homework, trying to make sure that it's the level of that zone of proximity for students where they're learning and practicing, but they're not so fatigued. They can't right. be happy as they go to sleep at night or they don't have time yes. for their family and the mm -hmm. other things that make a rich life because we want that as well. So it's you know, it's always a work in progress. Yes. Thank you. I love how you're looking at all that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The whole child. Trustee Crane. Yes, hi. Uh, um, great report. Very thorough. On page 25, which was under priority six for school climate, uh, it says, you know, school have a participation rate goal of 85%. Can you share your thoughts of why the response is below expectations, specifically, you know, like in fifth or 11th? Like why, how is participation affected by that? Like how? Every year there's a different level of opting in and opting out. And I think okay. that's just re represented there. And it, all, all it tells you is that not 100% of the students responded. So you know that 30% of the 11th graders are not re represented here. Yeah. You take it with a grain of salt because you have to use the data that's in front of you. So attendance could be part of it too. Like if, if it's possible, if there's a site that has low, lower attendance or it's possible, rates and, but typically so a lot you of don't factors. have 30% of your 11th graders absent all on the same day. So like more of an opt out situation. For fifth grade, I would say so. Well, and some of it might be low motivation if they don't, 
I mean, it's very, uh, it has a long-term deliverable. So if sharing your feelings in that way doesn't feel like it's going to produce anything <laughs> in the short term, it might not be worth it to a student to kind of be that vulnerable and that kind of dramatic about themselves if it's not going to result in something like today. I can tell my teacher, why do I have to fill the survey out? Mm -hmm. So it is a grain of salt. But it's a snapshot. It's a snapshot of a general sensibility of how our students are doing. And it's important data for us to paint a picture of what probably is likely most true. And do, do, you, do you find that certain sites have a, a higher participation rate than others? So could it be a site-based or just, I guess, it depends on demographics or whatever? It depends on a lot of things. I mean, it depends on yeah. when. It depends on what else when. is going on on campus. Right. Yeah. There's, there's many factors that go into a student feeling ready or, or, or families feeling ready to participate. Thank you. And I, th I think we shared this last um, presentation as well, but one of the things we have found very valuable and we're going to invest in even greater are really student focus groups and focus group. Again, it's not ev how everybody feels because it is like a smaller group. But it is a more interactive dialogue, so you do get a level of depth that you don't get from a survey answer. So where in surveys you can have more people, you have very fixed questions and answers. But the student focus groups go quite deep, but it's a small little group. So combining it together plus right. the experiences of the adults on campus really helps us inform where we're going and how we, how we make sense of what is so we can get better. Okay. Great. Thank you. one question um, on slide 30 um, it talks about how the district will assess itself and it gives four um, areas is that state generated or are those ours and how often does it change like is it similar to our LCAP where every three years we can adjust it or we can adjust it we can add I wouldn't suggest taking away I think that um, it makes a lot of sense as a complement to the LCAP, um, but we can, we can always look at um, if there's another snapshot that we need to, to add to the flavor. Absolutely. Great. All right. Thank you so much. This okay. is very informative. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Next, we have item 18, the consent calendar. Do we have any questions? I'm going to have uh, Mr. Trader come up and to give some more information on item 18A1, the Estancia Theater, please. Just to provide some clarity. So 18A1 is uh, uh, authority to um, uh, approach Swinnerton and negotiate a uh, GMP or, or, or what's called a, uh, a guaranteed maximum price. And so uh, in our work with Flint, they've done a lot of work and, and we've determined that the best value to the district would be to approach Swinnerton to see if they could, um, we could negotiate a price below uh, what we believe uh, is, a, is a fair price, a guaranteed maximum price. We have Trustee Weigand. Um, can we ask some questions? Yes. yes. Um, does this, uh, the, the, just for clarity and I think some questions that were asked earlier, um, the, this is still going on as, as planned, timelines fine, not affected, we're still bu building the theater. That's correct. The, we're still right on schedule. So we're on schedule to start on time and finish with the 20 month uh, construction period. Thank you. Trustee Cray. Um, does, this is, a, of course, pending DSA approval, which we're still waiting for. Is that That's correct? That's correct. Yeah, we expect to receive DSA approval here in July. And when was it expected in our, in our initial timeline? Was it uh, June? Um, you know, I don't recall. Uh, I, I affirmed, uh, so if I said June, then it's, it's moved back to July. I just affirmed that with um, uh, Ada uh, today about when, when we expect that from DSA. We don't have a whole lot of control over when 
they get things back to us, uh, but we do expect it back in July. Okay. <coughs> and when we hear things about costs from 2019, what were some of the impacts perhaps of COVID related to cost and supply chain? Yeah, as you're aware, I mean, supply chain and inflation have been uh, substantial, especially in construction. And so we have experienced significant uh, increases in costs associated with supply chain and inflation. Okay. Do we have any additional questions? Do you know also, I, I've always wondered this, that for the measure F that I think was in 2006, um, do you know why? Was there like, how did, how did Estancia Theater get chosen last? Because I think none of us were on the board at the time, and I think we hear concerns about that, and none of us were on the board. We weren't able to make that choice. We, we didn't choose when Estancia was getting a theater. I think some of us would have chosen first. Um, but so how, like, what did that process for choosing who got a theater did? Was it because we got a field first at Estancia, or how did that work out? You know, I wish I could tell you it wasn't a part of those discussions, and so I really don't know. I'm sorry, I don't know. Yeah, it's a mystery for some of us, right? We, I think we would have wanted it to happen earlier. Okay, do we have any additional questions? Okay, thank you so much. All right, moving on, do we have a motion to approve the consent calendar? Motion. Second. Okay, moved by Trustee Ursulu, seconded by Trustee Barto. Roll call vote. Trustee Anderson? Yes. Trustee Crane? Yes. Trustee Wigand? Yes. Trustee Pearson? Yes. Trustee Murphy? Yes. Trustee Ursulu? Yes. Trustee Barto? Yes. Great, number 19, the discussion action calendar. 19A, approving the 2023-2024 student board members. Uh, I would like to move to approve the selection of student board members for the next academic year, 2023-2024. So moved. Or second. 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 Excuse me. <laughs> I, I, I wasn't quite sure what that was. Moved by Trustee Crane, seconded Sorry. by Trustee Wigand. Roll call vote. Trustee Anderson? Yes. Trustee Crane? Yes. Trustee Wigand? Yes. Trustee Pearson? Yes. Trustee Murphy? Yes. Trustee Ursulu? Yes. Trustee Barto? Yes. Yes, you've all been approved. Thank you for staying. Yeah. yeah. And we are on item 19B, approve the agreement for employment of Assistant Superintendent Elementary between the Board of Education of the New Permanente Unified School District and Dr. Kurtzer, dated June 20, 2023. Dr. Smith. Yeah, you know, it's like to say this is an extremely important uh, position. You've seen the data and, and the work that we have in front of us that we're excited to engage. And when we open this up, people say they do a national search and they only get people from their own backyard. We got people from all over the country mm -hmm. applying for this job. We wanted to have someone first and foremost of high integrity, um, someone that really deeply understands elementary education, can speak that language. Um, and who can speak to all sides of our community. In fact, one of our parents put it best, we need someone that comes in uh, that knows a bit about what we do, but also can speak to each constituent in this community because they are diverse. Um, I don't think we could have found a better candidate in the world than the one we found. Dr. Kurt, sir, has his doctorate. He is bilingual. He is an expert in elementary education as a teacher, as a principal, having served here um, lately as a director for quite some time. Um, he knows our district. He knows elementary education. He can speak to parents across this district, and he's respected by the principals. So very, very proud to bring his name to you tonight. And he's an alumni, don't forget that part. No. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. All right, do we have a motion? So moved. I second. second. Okay, moved Triple. by Trustee Wagon, seconded by Trustee Pearson. Roll call vote. Trustee Anderson? Yes. Trustee Crane? 
Yes. Trustee Wigan? Yes. Trustee Pearson? Yes. Trustee Murphy? Yes. Trustee Ursoilu? Yes. Trustee Barto? Yes. We're very excited for you and for us. All right, number 19C, adopt the local control and accountability plan. Ms. Shields, Ms. Galen, do you have an additional comment? No, just this is the formal adoption from last week that we, the presentation for both of these, for both C and D, so that we can send it on its Mary's way to the <laughs> Orange County Department of Education. Wonderful, okay, for 19C, do we have a motion? So moved. I'm, I'll have questions too, just yes. a few. Do you want to do after the second? Uh, yeah, is it on C or D? C. 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 Okay. So I moved it. And okay. Moved I'll, by I'll second. Okay. Seconded by Trustee Barto. Yes. What is your question? Um, for a couple of questions regarding the, some of the information in there. 65% um, unduplicated account. Unduplicated count. Sorry, I'm reading my notes. I'm not a very, I have really bad handwriting. Um, for our unduplicated count, was this an increase over previous years? It seems like it was. Yes, we have had an increase in the last couple of years reflecting the changing demographics of the district. It is absolutely an increase. Okay. And then um, one other question was on definitions. How do we, we how is 52% of low socioeconomic status calculated? I was looking for the metric. I'm not sure what that is. Uh, Vanessa can correct me if I'm wrong, but we use the free and reduced lunch when they actually do the application. So it is a measure of family income. And is that measurement based on like a ratio of like housing? Um, it's one of the poverty measures. So it's, it's the federal definition. Okay. Yeah. Because I'm just thinking of in this area versus federal, that might impact our 52% too. No, they use they use the same indicate. It actually would help us if they took into account the cost of living in our region. But they, I mean, it would be a more accurate description. But they use a, a federal definition that does not change by area. Okay. That does affect though our homeless numbers and other things like that. There are other indicators where it becomes clearer to us what the cost of living in our community means. Thank you. Trustee Murphy. So actually that brings up a good question. So are we sure that all of the schools are still having the, um, the families fill out the form? You know, with the change at the state level, it is harder to get some of this data because um, at least for a period of time, there was the free and reduced lunch kind of for all, lunch for all program, so it has made it more difficult. And we've always, quite honestly, at secondary had a harder time getting mm -hmm. accurate data because secondary students have no use for our lunch. If it's not fries and a Diet Coke, they could care less. Right? <laughs> so, I mean, hot Cheetos. Is so, there, is there, it is harder, but if anything, it's higher, probably not lower. Yeah, no, I would, I would mm -hmm. assume. Is there any plan to try to encourage the schools to make sure that the families fill it out regardless of whether it affects them or not? There's that, the homeless survey. There are a lot of things that we're trying to look through a trauma-informed lens to make sure that we have the relationship with families so they'd want to share that crisis information with us. It's not something necessarily that you tell a stranger. And so kind of making sure we have the relationship where families feel they can share with us and it'll matter for their child. It matters to tell you so much mm -hmm. about me that it will benefit my child or my student in the system. So work, we're working on building that credibility to get more information that's accurate. While making them feel that their information is confidential. 100%. Yeah. Thanks. Have we thought about possibly doing one, particularly for registering for next year, something that asks families, um, are you interested in receiving certain things? Because I think sometimes um, there are wide definitions for homelessness, there's wide definitions of need, and someone may not say, oh, yes, I need, I need food every day, but <coughs> if, if there is an item that asks certain questions, it might help us kind of ask, particularly if a student is filling out the information, not their parent, because <coughs> um, I just worry that we're not getting some of that information. And then since we don't have the welcome center 
um, being utilized in the same way. I think <coughs> having that conversation with the front office person or similarly to what Trustee Murphy was saying about the confidentiality, I worry that someone may not want to self-report. So I just think we need to find a way for registering for this upcoming year to try and crack that nut. We're always working on improving those practices and working with front office staff, the new elementary counselors, the school community facilitators, all of these people who have, we know have some of the deepest relationships with our families so that families feel they can reveal these things and we can collect more accurate information. But we're always seeking to make it more easier to self-report and easier to tell us along the way as we're building deeper relationships with families we're never going to be there. We're always going to be working harder to do that, both at the time of initial registration and continue throughout the year. Thank you very much. All right, roll call vote on 19C. Trustee Anderson? Yes. Trustee Crane? Yes. Trustee Wigan? Yes. Trustee Pearson? Yes. Trustee Murphy? Yes. Trustee Ursoilu? Yes. Trustee Bartow? Yes. Okay, 19D, approve, approve the local control and accountability Ability plan, federal addendum. Of a motion. So moved. Trustee Crane. Second. Seconded by Trustee Ursulu. Roll, roll call vote. Trustee Anderson. Yes. Trustee Crane. Yes. Trustee Wigand. Yes. Trustee Pearson. Yes. Trustee Murphy. Yes. Trustee Ursulu. Yes. Trustee Bartow. Yes. Okay. 19E, adopt resolution number 270623, all funds June budget 2023-2024. Have a motion? So moved. Okay, moved by Trustee Weigand. Second. Seconded by Trustee Murphy. Roll call vote. Trustee Anderson? Yes. Trustee Crane? Yes. Trustee Weigand? Yes. Trustee Pearson? Yes. Trustee Murphy? Yes. Trustee Ursulu? Trustee Barto. Yes. Okay. Next, 19F, appro approve the SELPA local plan services plan and SELPA annual budget plan for the 2023-2024 school year. Dr. Jockum. Oh, hello. Already. <laughs> She's already on the move. She's already up there. Uh, so. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Great, so um, uh, good evening, <coughs> President Anderson, members of the board, Dr. Smith, uh, cabinet and guests. I'm happy to um, give you a, just a really brief overview of where the SELPA money, our special education money kind of fits into our overall budget. So all of the monies that you're seeing and we're talking about are part of the budget you just approved um, uh, moving forward. So, oops. So uh, every year on an annual basis, um, the SELPA, which in our case we're a single district SELPA, we're required to turn in certain documents um, to the California Department of Education. And those include um, just some contact information, certifications. Um, there's um, a governance section that is only done every three years. Um, section C, the state hasn't decided what that's going to look like yet. They know there's something coming. And then we have an annual service plan and an annual budget plan. That's going to be, oh, it's not working. Um, and so our, for us, our local plan is um, compiled every year by our SELPA director. And in our case, that's Juliana Salvao, and she is our director of special education resolution and also our SELPA representative. And um, she compiles all of the necessary data. She has a meeting with members of our community advisory committee, and I know um, we have some board members on that. And then it's a requirement for the school board to um, approve um, approve the local um, service plan and budget plan. The, the services in the service plan, and I know you all got a copy of kind of what that looks like, um, essentially what it is is a snapshot of what our district is, is supposed to provide to students 
who have disabilities. And it's a coding system that the state puts forward. And so it lists all of the schools we have in our district. It lists all of our non-public schools, our um, residential treatment centers that we have commitments with. And then it talks about on the grid what types of services they, um, they have at those facilities or within our schools. So um, you could go across one of our elementary schools and go, oh, they provide speech and language services and ac you know, academic pullout and intervention. And then for some of our schools, you may see other services. So you may have a student in one of those schools who has some visual impairments or has some hearing impairments. And then you'll see some check marks there because then we provide those services. Services. So what we're required to do is demonstrate to the state that as a single district SELPA, we are um, ready, willing, and able to provide services to all students within our district. And that's kind of what, it, it, um, what this annual service plan entails. So I think one of the things that's very interesting to look at is really kind of where we are in our current uh, demographics for students with special needs in the district. And so if you look at the top, we are at 3,065 students in special, identified in special education, which is about a 17% of our total population. And um, that number has grown significantly in the last few years. And then if you look down at the different categories, you'll see kind of where, um, where our demographics play out in the district. So in terms of, of those 3,065 students, 663 of them are diagnosed and have an eligibility under autism, which equates to about 21, 22 percent of our, of our student special ed population. So this just gives a snapshot view of kind of what we're looking at. And then it's just interesting that um, currently in the district we don't have any students who are eligible under categories such as deaf, blind, established medical disability, or traumatic brain injury. That could change at any time we have new students come in or out. But it's just some of that information. Then I think what's also interesting to look at is this is kind of the projected plan for how we're going to spend money um, for the next year. And in special education, there's really three major um, sources of funding. There's state, federal, and local. And you may recall that IDEA, which is the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, when it was passed way back in 19... 75, I believe, and then reauthorized in 2004, and then again, I think they did something in 2008. The federal government promised to fund us at 40 percent of our special education um, in order, you know, they made all of these rules about how you have to do, you know, IEPs and different things. And right now, the, um, the federal government is, is pitching in about 7 percent. So we are a far cry. I think at the, at the height, maybe in 2008, when we got some other money, we were at about 17%. But we have, um, as a state, this isn't just our district, have really gone into decline in terms of what, the, what support the federal government has. The state, um, through our different funding sources, we get what's called AB 602A based on the number of students we have in our district. We get some money for our infants, and we get some mental health money. Um, that all told comes to 21% of, of our costs. And then our local contribution, um, which is also, people say, encroachment, um, but it is, an encro it is a contribution from the local general fund um, in our district is 70% of the cost of special education um, to the tune of $53,800,000. So that's a very significant um, investment that this district has made into students with, with disabilities. Um, and it, when you break that down and you look at it, um, just like all other parts of our budget, the, the vast majority um, of our costs in special education is for salary and benefits um, at 83%, and then the additional are other services or supports that we may have for students. So that's very typical, um, goes along with our budget. The one thing in special education that's a little bit unique is uh, the requirement that we have for maintenance of effort. 
And this is a requirement that if you get even that little 7% of federal funding, that you have to spend or project to spend the same amount as the year before. So if we're projecting that we're spending, you know, 73 to $76 million on students with special needs, we can't say, well, next year we're really going to we're going to, you know, really tighten our belt and we're going to go down and we're going to cut that. You have to, you are required to spend at least a dollar more every year unless there's certain criteria that would allow you to reduce that. So during COVID, we had that where um, we actually reduced our, our maintenance of effort, but there we, we actually met the criteria. Right now, we would not meet criteria to be able to do that. So it's just something to kind of keep in mind when, as people are talking about how costly special education is, and it is um, for, for you know, students in the district, but um, that it is a requirement that we have to be able to do that. So that's all I have in terms of information on the SELPA annual service and annual budget plan. I would ask that you approve those, or I'm happy to answer any questions. Trustee Murphy. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you for the update. I appreciate it. Um, on the current student information, where would uh, students with dyslexia fall under? Are there health impairment or specific learning disability? Typically, um, students with dyslexia would be under specific learning disability. Specific learning disability. It's not, a, it's, not its own category of yep. eligibility. But we are tracking it, right? We're tracking students who have dyslexia. We have, we have a dyslexia support team who's out there, but a lot of students aren't formally diagnosed with dyslexia. Um, so I don't know how we're tracking it. But I can but, ask that team. But yeah, because I think that's something the state's starting to look at, right? Okay. Is specifically I'll find out tracking from the team it. How yeah. they're doing that. Um, and then um, my other question is. Um, and this is probably a loaded question, um, <laughs> but on the projected expenditures of the 76 million, do you feel that's enough? Well, the, the nice thing about Newport Mesa and really most districts in terms of special education, there's always requirements, right? So if we had an additional 200 students move in and we had to hire more people and, and do that, those are conversations I have with Jeff, and we say, okay, how are we going to be able to do that? So there's always some contingencies built in in order to do that. But, you know, we're, we're really hoping in the next few years that we're able to really look at that multi-tiered system of support and, and really make sure that the students that we're finding eligible for special education really need those special specialized um, services and programs. Yes, because I think we've talked about that early assessment and how important it is. So um, is do you feel like this is enough to really address that issue? Yes. Thank and you. we also have it through, it doesn't mean we can't, that's just what we have to spend from the special ed side of the house. There's also other things kind of from gen ed too that we can look at. Adding Don't say that to Jeff. What? <laughs> I said I was just teasing. Don't say that. Do you it's notice how close I? I know. <laughs> like, sit, sit next to it. Jeff, him. I need money. <laughs> yeah. but thank you. Yes. Trustee Wigand. Um, thank you for this information. Uh, on the current student information um, slide five, are all of these have IEPs? So everyone in that three thousand headcount would be have an IEP or a five hundred four. Yes. It's okay. IEPs. IEPs. That doesn't count our students under Section 504. Okay. They're not considered special education. Oh, okay. So, but it, it also includes, there's a requirement in the law that we also um, count our students who have IEPs or are eligible for IEPs but are attending private school. Oh, um, so right. some of those right. probably maybe yeah. at the most like 100 and 150 of those mm -hmm. would be those students who... Um, have have active IEPs. They currently mm -hmm. qualify for special education, but their parents are choosing to send them to private school. So and, we track those. Okay, and we don't provide. We just do the diagnosis of that. We don't necessarily provide the services, right? What we're or, required to do is spend a percentage of our 
revenue, our money on students who are in private school. And we have a program specialist who serves all of our private schools. And she goes out quarterly, um, sometimes monthly, does different trainings with the schools. She'll observe students in the classroom. She'll make recommendations. Um, a lot of schools right now, it's students with autism you know, who have a lot of um, social emotional or social skills issues and so we've we've purchased some um, training materials for them we've we've provided some staff development all of those things count towards kind of the percentage of money we spend for those students okay and then out of that 76 million in this budget does that also include maybe updates we need to do to Harper Assessment Center or any of that kind of like facilities improvements part of that or that would just be mostly facilities improvements no, no, Jeff says no. That comes okay. out of his money. <laughs> <laughs> Good. <laughs> um, all right, thank you. Okay. Trustee Crane. Yes, thank you. So uh, my question is on slide five, current student information. Is there, in these numbers, is there like a comorbidity where, where let's say we do have an autistic uh, student but al who also has a speech language impairment or a specific learning disability? So is there like a co- more so in these numbers. there are opportunities within an IEP to have a primary diagnosis and a secondary oh, okay. diagnosis. So that's how you but get to for purposes of counting our students for this, we're only counting the primary disability. Oh, okay, when we report to the state, however, they're looking at primary and secondary disabilities. Mm, okay. So um, we do include both. Okay. Thank you. And you answered my question about how many were in private school. Thank you very much. Do we have any additional questions? Thank no. you. Thank you. Thank this you. was really helpful. All right. 19F, approving the SOPA local plan. Do I have a motion? Moved. Okay. Moved by Trustee Murphy. Seconded. Second. <laughs> by sure. Trustee Crane. Roll call vote. Trustee Anderson. Yes. Trustee Crane. Yes. Trustee Wigan. Yes. Trustee Pearson. Yes. Trustee Murphy. Yes. Trustee Ursoilu? Yes. Trustee Bartow? Yes. 19G, approve addition to high, high school and middle school course of study. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Okay, moved by Trustee Crane, seconded by Trustee Murphy. Roll call vote. Trustee Anderson? Yes. Trustee Crane? Yes. Trustee Wigan? Yes. Trustee Pearson? Yes. Trustee Murphy? Yes. Trustee Ursoilu? Yes. Trustee Bartow? Yes. 19H, approved middle school English language arts textbook adoption. And I believe we have a brief report from Mr. Shaka, Dr. Shaka. We do, and while he's getting set up, um, his uh, presentation is gonna include um, items for, sorry, H, I, and J. Okay. Well, good evening, President Anderson, members of the board, Dr. Smith, executive cabinet, and all of our guests. Um, thank you for giving us the opportunity to give you a, a brief review. Um, I'd like to share an update and recommendation on three sets of materials for secondary schools. Um, as we know, the adoption of high quality and higher rigor materials is foundational to high levels of learning. So with that said, I'd like to start off with our middle school English language arts. Uh, the current book that we have adopted is, uh, was adopted in 2002, and it's Timeless Voices, Timeless Themes by Pearson. Tonight, we're going to present our recommendation to the board to adopt uh, for language arts 7th and 8th grade study sync, starting in the 23-23 school year, or 23-24 school year, excuse me. In addition, secondary world <coughs> languages. We currently have Discovering French, which was adopted in 2018, and Advancemos for levels 1 through 4. Um, which was ado adopted in 2013. Tonight, we're going to recommend Carnegie for French and Vista for both our traditional Spanish 1 through 4 and for our native speakers, Spanish. And finally, for AP Environmental Science, our current adoption is for AP, uh, is for Environmental Sciences for the AP Courses second edition, and we'd like to adopt uh, edition 4 for our AP Environmental Science classes. So that being said, I'd, I'd like to give a review of kind of the process that we went through to get to the point that we are um, that we are at tonight, which is an exciting point. In the fall of 2022, we formed our pilot committees. 
in all three of these areas and had representatives from all of our zones in multiple grade levels. We included our special education teachers. We met approximately monthly to go through the pretty in-depth process of selecting the appropriate materials for these classes. The pilot committee reviewed publishers and narrowed our options down to two different sets of materials that we chose to pilot. And really what the pilot entailed is each teacher that was part of the committee, again, once the um, two sets of materials were selected, we opened it up to every teacher in that subject area to participate in the pilot uh, for the unit of study. So they would pilot one unit of study and go through it as if, as if it was our curriculum uh, to assess its strengths, its drawbacks, and how it fit in to the culture of our district um, and really the needs of our students. During the pilot phase, we used consensus building, which means that we really, we really utilized our teachers' collective wisdom to say, can we find a set of materials that everyone is on board with? Do we have consensus? And I'm proud to say that we reached consensus in all three of these adoptions. I'd certainly like to take this moment to thank all of our adoption uh, committee team members. They spent tremendous time and effort and emotional energy going through this process to make sure we get it right. And I really think that we have gotten it right on this one because while in some experiences it's um, let's pick the one that's close enough, we just weren't there with these, with these sets of materials. We were really excited about all three. And while no sets of materials are perfect, we think that these are going to be a great match and a foundation for our students as we move forward. So if you recall, on May 17th, uh, Keith Carmona was in front of all of you, and we approved, you approved, the 30-day public review for each of these texts. So these have been on public display, both digitally on our website and um, hard copies in the Sanborn building. And so we went through the 30-day review process. As of June 19th, we didn't have any digital comments, but we did have a group of parents come in and meet with our director of teaching and learning, had what was described to me as a great productive conversation, great questions were asked, um, and it's my understanding that, that uh, the meeting end, ended well and it was a positive, positive interaction. And so that brings us to our next steps, where we are today. And, and it is recommended to the school board by myself and our curriculum adoption teams that study sync for middle school ELA, Vista Higher Learning for Spanish, Carnegie for French, and environmental science for AP courses um, are, are recommended for adoption for Newport Mesa Unified School District. If it is uh, adopted, we will immediately start a professional development and onboarding process so that our teachers are prepared to uh, be ready to implement this in 23-24 uh, in school year. So at this point, if there's any questions, I can answer. Trustee Barto. Um, for study seek. Will there be additional supplementary materials used by teachers, like additional books that they read? I think last year at Ensign they read a book about the Holocaust whose name I can't recall. Yeah, so, so there will be um, novels certainly will be integrated into the ELA experience at all of our grade levels. So um, the short answer is yes, and that will be up to our English teachers and administrators on site to come up with this aligned experience to where we determine what's, what supplements are needed and how they're implemented. So I, I, the novels are a great example. OK, thank you. Trustee Weigand. Um, my question is not necessarily about the material, but just a, a thought on, on the process that um, I had a, a community member ask me if there was a spot maybe on our like website when we are doing reviews for um, books that we can say, here's our you know 30 day notice on these certain books to let them know in a in an easy to find place, because otherwise, you know, unless they watch this or it's hard to find, for instance. So if we had a more prominent section on our website that said, okay, here's the books that are under review for 30 days. So it's really, you know, public facing. That was just a comment that I had had, but um, I appreciate going through the adoption of these and um, the process that you do go through, but just in case to be more forward facing for the public. So thank you. Thank you. And obviously hyper local because there's a coyote on the cover of the science book. Yeah, and we do not endorse coyotes on our campus. No, we do not. On there's the one at CDM. <laughs> it's a plastic oh, yeah. one. A <laughs> fake one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any additional questions? Okay, do I have a motion to approve 19H, the middle school English language arts textbook adoption? So moved. 
Second. Okay. Moved by Trustee Crane, seconded by Trustee Ursulu. Roll call vote. Trustee Anderson? Yes. Trustee Crane? Yes. Trustee Wigan? Yes. Trustee Pearson? Yes. Trustee Murphy? Yes. Trustee Ursulu? Yes. Trustee Bartow? Yes. 19i, approved secondary science textbook for adoption. Do you have a motion? So moved. Moved by Trustee Ursulu. Second. Second by Trustee Crane. Roll call vote. Trustee Anderson? Yes. Trustee Crane? Yes. Trustee Wigan? Yes. Trustee Pearson? Yes. Trustee Murphy? Yes. Trustee Ursulu? Yes. Trustee Bartow? Yes. 19j, approved secondary world language textbook adoption. Do you have a motion? So moved. Moved by Trustee Pearson. Second. Seconded by Trustee Crane. Roll call vote. Trustee Anderson? Yes. Trustee Wait. Crane? What? Wait. Yes. Sorry. Yes. Trustee Wigan? Yes. Trustee Pearson? Yes. Trustee Murphy? Yes. Trustee Ursulu? Yes. Trustee Barto? Yes. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Shaka. And now we'll move on to our informal reports. Dr. Smith. Since our last board meeting, I haven't attended any activities. Uh, I was off for my 30th anniversary celebration. Um, yeah, quite an accomplishment. My wife would uh, agree with that, given my personality. Uh, but I would like to keep this in front of you. We've, we're working with the city of Newport Beach to discuss uh, their city library and, and continue the conversation we started last week about that. Similarly, um, I have been meeting with, continue to meet with the city manager in Costa Mesa. There is a, um, a joint interest in having uh, more green space for our Costa Mesa residents. Um, they have an opportunity to provide that. We certainly will help uh, on our end where it's appropriate while always prioritizing the safety and sanitation of our campuses for our students. So keep you posted on those things. All right, thank you. Those are great updates. All right, Trustee Crane. We'll go down this way. Yes, I, I want to compliment our students, speakers tonight who were so eloquent and articulate. It's always uh, so nice to hear their voices because they're the ones who are going through the ex experience and again, you know, we're not there on campus feeling the anxiety and then finding a place to, to find, uh, you know, support. So thank you students for your eloquence and art articulate, uh, articulation of your feelings and emotions. Uh, also, as currently as the uh, sole remaining trustee that was a proponent of location two, I do feel compelled to also acknowledge the frustration that we've heard tonight from our speakers, from the community. But you know, of course, as you all said, we do need to move forward because that's the best thing to do for our students. We need to get that theater built. We need to get it done as, as thoughtfully and fiscally responsibly as possible, but we definitely need to move forward. So thank you for coming tonight. We, we do hear you and we hear the fact that you want these kids, you want to get these kids a theater. So thank you for that. Uh, it's, we wanted to thank uh, the Costa Mesa United Soccer uh, Organization that, uh, I guess, I guess they're Costa Mesa United. They sponsored the Costa Mesa Classic, Soccer Classic, uh, specifically Brett Eccles and Kirk McIntosh. They had 177 teams participate in the three, four days. Is it a four day soccer tournament or a three day? Yeah four-day soccer tournament. So thank you for the efforts and for the collaboration and having our kids out there doing uh, wellness, soccer, outside, outdoor exercise, all great. And we see Trustee Barto and Murphy and I attended the Save Our Youth Gala last Saturday. Save Our Youth was, was celebrating the 30th anniversary of serving our communities a community and uh, just a, a wonderful event to be there and support them because they are a great partner. So um, that was actually also very fun. And that's it for now. Thank you. Trustee White. Um, I have not attended many uh, organized meetings since our last meeting, but um, I just wanted to um, voice the just thank you to everyone getting ready for summer school. It's going to be a, a great four weeks. And also thank you for all of the facilities updates that are or upgrades are going on during the summer. So, you know, I get a lot of questions like, oh, so you get the summer off or does the district get the summer off? And un unfortunately, no, we were planning for next year. We're planning for August when we see our, our students back and uh, planning for all of the wonderful summer programs that we have. So. Thank you everyone for working on that. 
Yes, I have not been very busy this last week myself, and I wasn't on vacation either. Um, <laughs> but it was very, um, it was very nice hearing from our, our student voices. It was um, incredible, and I'm proud of them for coming and for speaking up. It was very nice. Thank you. Um, I would just say the soy event, it was great to hear from the graduates, too, and mm -hmm. their experience about yeah. how much soy helped them uh, go visit colleges, fill out applications, yeah. help them with testing. Um, so that was really great to hear as well about how successful some of those soy students are. Most of all of them are. Um, very successful. So thank you to Soy for doing that for our kids. Um, and then I would be remiss if I didn't um, shout this out for my neighbor, um, who is one of the assistant coaches of the Newport Mesa girls softball team, 10U. They are silver champions. They're qualifying for the state championship. They're number one in the Ten district. Years. They beat out 23 teams. It's the first time that Newport Mesa girls softball has won this title. So wow. okay. congratulations to them. There's a bunch of Newport Mesa students on that team. So I'm not just shouting them out randomly. So there you go. <laughs> Where are you going with this? My neighbor is happy though. <laughs> Um, we, ha I've been, um, been to a lot of things. We'll start with the Community Alliance for Bike Safety. Uh, Trustee Crane and I had a meeting last week and we, um, were lucky enough to get some visits from our Newport Beach City Council member, um, Eric Weigand and our Sohosta Mesa City Council member, Arliss Reynolds, um, along with uh, lots of other involved community members and the uh, Newport Beach City Traffic Engineer. Um, the purpose of our group is to kind of coordinate efforts and um, each person who comes usually comes with a long list of things that they've already done to help with bike safety since we last met. Um, one of the things that we um, have, have found and are hoping to achieve for the fall is there are several e-bike safety videos kind of floating around that have been created both by our CDM students and our uh, Newport Harbor students and uh, City of Costa Mesa and um, working on coordinating those so that they're widely distributed to mm -hmm. all of our students. Um, we already, so they're all really high quality um, material, content and materials. So putting those out there so that students can really understand would be um, it's one of our goals. And then um, increasing the number of bike rodeos on campuses, something mm -hmm. that um, the uh, Rotary Club and PTAs are very passionate about. Um, and then just c continuing our efforts with uh, bike safety education during PE as we have been at the middle school. So um, lots of, of great things that we've done in the last, I think, year and a half that we have been meeting and not and just everybody brings so much to the table of what mm -hmm. they've done. Um, but those are our goals for the, for the following year is the you know, increase in bike rodeos and training and uh, distribution of those videos. Um, Additionally, I attended the statewide PTA convention. It was on Zoom, so that was convenient. Um, I could attend it from my home. Uh, lots of going on, lots of um, passionate parents, and um, lots of new faces. People, you, it's so many times the same people, um, and it's great to see a lot of new involvement. Um, then meeting with some community members this week. Uh, we've done such a great job in transparency, um, but. People are always asking for more. So one, a few comments were um, a greater ability to, a greater understanding of how to reach out to um, board members if an issue maybe hasn't been resolved at their school site. Um, with our new website, maybe there's some ways that we could put that more front and center. Um, somebody brought up the idea of like a virtual comment card um, on the, the very front of the website. So um, people are, we've made, a, we have, this great new website, I was thinking it'd be a good chance to use that to kind of um, mm -hmm. solve that last piece for people. And that is all. Um, I <laughs> don't have much going on. Um, so I would just say thank you to the Bridges students that were here. Um, it really, um, 
moved my heart as a as a geek because I, um, in my real life job, um, helped with the redesign of bridges and I did the data analysis to proof the concept about 15 or ish years ago and then again in a revamp seven years ago. So I never get to actually see the kids. I just see a bunch of data <laughs> and I write a bunch of reports about things. So actually getting to see the kids of like a project that I had a hand in is like so exciting. So tell them that they made my day um, and I was so glad to see them here. Thank you. Um, and I understand there were 1,600 secondary students that started today, wow. which I think coming from where we were a couple of years ago wow. um, and summer school for secondary was only about re credit recovery um, and wasn't widely extended to a lot of students. I'm really excited to hear that 1,600 students are taking us up on that offering and that our teachers were willing to teach this summer. That's also <laughs> incredible. We need both. <laughs> so thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm also really excited that we now finally, five years, have Lexia at every single elementary school. Our principals have been asking for that for years. And so I'm so excited that that is going to be a reality for the fall. Um, and I just wanted to echo um, the comments that we heard um, and received about bridges, particularly actually from some of the teachers. I would say we had, um, gosh, I think probably over 20 teachers from Newport Harbor that shared personal stories about how they had seen students um, that hadn't been included or they weren't sure how to care for them in their classroom because there were so many students that they were serving that they were able to give them somewhere safe to go and that they all felt connected. Um, and so I just thank you for um, the dedication, Debbie, that you've done for 18 years. That's incredible. <laughs> and I agree. I think we should have it on other campuses. I think that um, if the students spoke for themselves that it's clearly a need. Um, and so it's something to look forward to, perhaps. Um, and I also just wanted to echo one of the other things um, about the theater um, that we tried to um, make sure that costs were as low as possible was to keep the same design. And I think one of the students that came and spoke um, that represented Estancia this year thanked the board um, because the students didn't really know what the plans were. And so they were able to see for the first time this year what the design was, what it looked like. Um, and so I think we all want it to be built as soon as possible. And hopefully in 20 months, it will be done and we can all be there and it would be lovely. Um, so thank you for continuing to work on all of that, Mr. Trader. All right, and it is 8.19, and so we will adjourn our meeting now. Thank you.